years I have uh, taught an exegesis class in our church. And basically what we do is we study verse by verse through a book in the Bible. And uh, exegesis class is going to begin in on October 27th. And um, September 27th. Don't listen to me. Look it up online. Uh, uh, and w yeah, Sharon should teach the class. Uh, and we'll be studying uh, uh, verse by verse through the book of Galatians. So if that, <clears throat> if that sounds interesting to you, um, I'd love to have you in the class. Dear Heavenly Father, Uh, you have shown yourself to us in scripture as uh, the God who uh, shares himself with others. You take the initiative, you create the friendship. From the riches of your grace, you show us kindness and we begin to sense what a privilege it is to be your friend. I pray that that same spirit could touch us and we could have a sense that we're better together, especially when we're trying new things. And I ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. If you went to the harbor of Seleucia 48 years AD you might have seen three men walking toward a boat the youngest one was obviously wealthy you could tell by the cut and the quality of his clothes that he came from a family that had money Right next to him was a taller man who, if you were perceptive at all, you, know, you would know that he was a gentle soul. He always seemed to have a pleasant smile on his face. He always had a word of encouragement for others. The shortest of the three was very different than the other two. Uh, he didn't seem to walk. It was more like a march. There was an intensity about everything he did. Uh, he could be very intimidating. I'm describing to you John Mark, Barnabas, and Saul. The day that they got on a boat and began something brand new in Christianity, purposefully going to other towns to start churches. It was brand new. Every church that had been dis had started before this was kind of started accidentally by people fleeing persecution and, and meeting each other in other towns. For the first time, the church said, we've got a new agenda. We have the same message, but a new method. This began at the church in Antioch. Luke tells us that at the church in Antioch, there were five pastors. In fact, he tells us their names. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Mahanan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And the church was thriving and growing. And they must have, been ha they must have had a staff planning day. And during that staff planning day, um, the Holy Spirit said, I've placed, I've placed a new idea in Barnabas and Saul. And I want the church to support it. 
the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Paul and so, uh, 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 Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to. And so the church uh, prayed for them. They laid their hands on them and ordained them, and they sent them off. Antioch became a sending church. I want to talk to you about the idea of a sending church. There have to be healthy churches in the world that send people to create new ministry. That's how Christianity has spread for 2,000 years. Healthy churches develop people, and then they send those people out to create new ministry. If you know our church, uh, we have started two campuses. Uh, one campus is in uh, Elyria, and it's thriving. Um, we started a campus in Old Brooklyn. Uh, we were going to start a campus, but we're going to merge that new campus with the Old Brooklyn campus. We are a sending church. But I dream of us being a yearly sending church. Because in the book of Acts, that's exactly what the model is. Strong churches developed programs that developed people, and then those people were willing to go start other churches or go help other failing churches or go do ministry that we haven't even dreamed up yet. So this morning I'm talking to you about this, this idea that if we're going to try new things, we're better together. It's just easier to try something new if you're on a team with some people you like than if you have to do it all by yourself. Am I right? Uh, it makes the job easier if you, if you feel like I'm doing this with some other people. I, I like them. They like me. We'll, we, we'll work together. No one will ever have to do this alone. And that's exactly what happened. The church didn't say to Saul, you go out there and do this by yourself. The church didn't say to Barnabas, hey, you're a happy guy. People will like you. You go do this by yourself. What the church said was, we think you'll be more effective if you do this together as a team of three people. If I were to ask you this morning, are you on a team? In your life, are you on any teams? Well, hopefully your home feels a little bit like a team. Uh, uh, Sharon and I gang up on things. It makes it easier than if either one of us have to do it by ourselves. Uh, uh, are you, d does your family have a team spirit? Are, are, are you on a work team at work? Uh, do, you have, do you have any friends that you, you, would, you would say, we're like team players together? Are, are you in a life group? with another group of people teaming up to try to grow into your best spiritual self. So the New Testament gives this model. The New Testament says, you probably can't get there by yourself. But if you're willing to be a team player, it opens up a lot of opportunities and your chances of accomplishing beautiful things in life go up. Church. We're better together as teams because in the wisdom of God, all of us have different abilities and skills. Uh, uh, you've heard me joke, it would not be a pleasant day at church if I led singing today. Um, that would not be pleasing to anybody. Uh, so if one person th thinks they're capable of doing it all, you get in trouble because none of us have all of the gifts and skills. But if each one of us says, I'm, I'm aware that God has made me good at this, and then we play on teams together, we do ministry together, we go to life groups together, everybody benefits from the uniqueness of the other people on the team. Church. 
the Browns are going to play football tomorrow night. Not everybody plays the same position. There's 22 positions. And if, there was, if, if all the team had was quarterbacks, we would lose every game. If all the team had was sinners, we would lose every game. For the team to win, it takes the, the 11 different players on offense and the 11 different players on defense. And because they bring different skill sets, the team has a chance to win. The same thing is true in the Christian life. God gifts us all in different ways, and then he asks us to be on a team. And as we, as we join a team, we join a life group, we join a ministry team, what happens is the benefits that, uh, from others, we, the, the skills of others we benefit from, and others benefit from our skills. And so they got on this boat, and they sailed from the coast of Syria to the island of Cyprus. Uh, if you got a map in the back of your Bible, you can see this uh, missionary trip, and you can see that it's not really, really far from Seleucia to uh, a Cyprus. And they landed at a port town in Cyprus called Salamis. It was, it was new. Uh, we, don't, we don't know that any of them had ever been there before. Uh, I've, I've visited uh, 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 Greece and I've visited Israel. And there's something about being at a strange place you've never been before. It's kind of an adventure. Anybody? Uh, there, there's something, the unknown, the adventure of it all. I can see these three guys getting off the boat and looking around. And uh, it's not like uh, they had an itinerary. It's not like somebody was meeting them there and guiding them on their little uh, Cyprus trip. They had to figure it out as they, as they went. You know what they were doing? They were living the adventure of faith. Do you remember last week I said we have four things in our mission and one of them is the adventure of faith. When we're willing to be on a team with other people, and we're willing to try something new, we start living the adventure of faith. Christianity isn't the same old boring thing year after year after year after year. We get, we get the opportunity to do something fresh and beautiful with Christ. And that's exactly what's happening here in the book of Acts. And so the Bible says that on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and they taught the people there about Jesus. You see, they have a new method, but the message is the same. Can you hear this, church? Our methods have to change. Our message is the same. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Jesus Christ is the hope of every soul. At the, at the center of every human solution is the face of Jesus Christ. And when we start new things and when we develop new methods, we have to be careful that we don't lose our, method, our message in the methods. The, the methods come and go. Uh, Forty years ago, uh, our church was radically different than other churches. Uh, we were a baby boomer church. And everybody has said baby boomers aren't going to want to go to church. But... Uh, we started doing things differently. We had, we had a band and guitars and drums, and, and uh, 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 we weren't nearly as stuffy as some of the other churches. <laughs> uh, uh, our method was different, but our message was the same. Now, I want you to understand, church, if we're going to be the century church we're dreaming of being, we have to see that our methods change generationally, but our message stays the same. Do you see? The things that are going to uh, 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 reach uh, younger people and a new generation, that's going to take different methods. But our message will stay the same. Right? Um, Uh, 
Barnabas and Paul are leading this, but they took John Mark along with them because they wanted to mentor him. They thought, this young man has potential, and if we take him with us on this mission, uh, he's going to see how it's done. It's gonna, it, it might ignite something in him, and he might want it. God might be able to use him to do the same thing in the future. Uh, I, I wonder, are you open to having some younger people in your life and mentoring them so that who knows what God might do with them in, in future days? Do you see? Um, the, the, the leaders that, were, are, uh, that will take over this church, I started mentoring them when they were teenagers. Do you see? And, uh, and now they have, uh, they have these years of mentoring, and they're prepared to serve God in ways they wouldn't have been prepared. I wonder if you have room in your life, it, on your team, to invite a younger person in and make an investment in them and, and, and model for them and, and pray with them and, and, and have meaningful discussions with them so that they grow up into their full potential and who knows what God will do with them uh, in the coming days. Do you see? If you are a younger person, are you willing to be mentored? Are you willing to join a team and be mentored? Are you willing to connect with some other healthy people in a regular way, be encouraged, inspired, be challenged, so that you can grow into your full potential? This new method, this new ministry, created new opportunities but new problems. Okay, can we, can we just be honest? It created some wonderful new opportunities, but it also created some new problems. So, they, uh, they uh, spend a, a, a weekend at uh, a Salamis, and then they walk all the way across the island. Luke doesn't tell us what they did when they were walking across the island, but we know the kind of guy Paul was. He was having conversations with somebody everywhere he went. And they got to the far west end of the island uh, 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 at a town called Apaphos. Uh, the Roman government owned uh, Cyprus. And so they would send a proconsul there to govern the island for a term of time. And the proconsul who was there at this time was a man named Sergius Paulus. Let me talk to you about proconsuls a little bit. Proconsuls were Roman senators. And there were two kinds of proconsuls. One proconsul was appointed by uh, the uh, emperor, and another kind of proconsul was appointed by the Senate. Uh, Sergius Paulus was probably appointed by the Senate. He was a senator. Uh, they needed somebody to govern Cyprus. Uh, they said, it's your turn. You got to go there. And he was, he was probably there somewhere between uh, one and four years. And Paul went to the city where he had his uh, Roman uh, headquarters. And somehow or another, Sergius Paulus, somebody told them, him, what Barnabas and Saul were talking about. And Sergius Paulus said, I want you to come to my house and I want you to explain this to me. Do you know they would have never had this opportunity if they would have stayed in, 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 in Antioch? They would have never had this opportunity if, if they wouldn't have been willing to try this new thing together. But because they were willing to leave their comfort zone and they were willing to go on the adventure of faith, now they're sharing the gospel with a man who was an influential senator and who governs the whole island of Cyprus. You see, if you're willing to bump out of your comfort zone, God helps you to run into the right people and the right opportunities at the right times, and, and, and he does remarkable things. But if you're not willing to move out of your comfort zone a little bit, you're never going to meet Sergius Paulus, and you're never going to have the wonderful uh, experience that uh, Barnabas and Saul had. Uh, Luke said Sergius Paulus was a very intelligent man and he wanted to hear the word of the Lord from them. And so uh, they went and uh, 
they, they shared uh, the gospel with Sergius Paulus. Um, but it turns out that there was another guy there named Elimus. Uh, he must have been Jewish because his, he, he was, he's also called Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus. And he was a fraud. He was a, he was a magician. He could do magic tricks and made people think that he really had some kind of power. But it was just magic tricks. Uh, you, you've seen these magic shows on TV where they can do ridiculous things. Uh, all right. Elimus used his ability to do tricks to influence people. And he didn't want to lose his influence with Sergius Paulus. So he resisted everything Paul and Barnabas said. Where there, when we try new things, there are new opportunities, but there are also new problems, church. We mustn't think that we can try new things and be problem-free. We mustn't think that we can try hard things and not have to solve hard problems and not run into difficult moments and not have unpleasant uh, uh, um, experiences. Uh, it's part of... Uh, trying to be effective for Jesus Christ and do new things. So, Sergius Paulus is listening to the gospel. Elimus is creating a problem and doing everything he can to uh, turn uh, uh, Sergius Paulus's attention. And Paul puts up with it for a little while. And... Uh, um, then he got pretty intense. Uh, he put up with uh, uh, Sergius Paulus uh, doing this for a while, and then one day, uh, Paul called him. I'll read you what it says. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and looked intently at Elimus and said... You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you are full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Ah, uh, that's pretty direct. Uh, remember I told you he was intense? Uh, uh, uh. I don't have apostolic authority. Uh, Paul had apostolic authority, and, and he had divine authority to rebuke people. I believe I don't have apostolic authority, and it is my intention when I have to solve problems to do it with the spirit of grace and gentleness, church. Can you hear me? Yeah. It is my intention to, it, to confront every problem we have to confront and to do it with the spirit of uh, 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 grace and gentleness. Let me remind you, grace means treating people better than what they deserve. We can't work on teams. We can't solve hard problems. We can't do new ministry and not work on teams with other people and treat them better than what they deserve. Do you hear me? I know some of you have been on work teams and, and somebody hasn't been as friendly as they should be. I, I know you've been disappointed by a life group or something, but let me tell you this. Listen. Uh, the spirit of Jesus Christ is a spirit of grace. And we're going to accomplish a lot more by treating each other better than what we deserve than we are going to by uh, laying down the law and balling each other. So basically, that means three things. Would you open your heart to this? I think you ought to talk to God before you talk mean to somebody. Before you give yourself permission to speak harshly to somebody, why don't you just pause for a minute and say to Christ, uh, uh, I feel like saying this to them. And let Christ say, yeah, but just because you feel like it doesn't mean you should church 
The second thing. Ah. Don't send that nasty email. Don't do it. Do you think, do you really think, I, I get these emails, they're like, you, you got to scroll through them 15 minutes. It's a, a, a 15 minute diatribe on an email. All right. Do you really think I'm going to read that and go, oh, you're right. I, 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 I should, uh, why didn't I figure this out before? Nobody's going to read those snotty emails and have an epiphany. It's going to do just the opposite. They're going to read your snotty email and say, you're a snotty person. <laughs> so being gracious while we are solving problems mean we're not going to send those ugly emails. No, I want an amen on that. Amen. Thank you. The third thing, I, I believe, if we're going to be gracious with one another, uh, we have to remember that we all need grace too. Do, do you hear this? You're going to have a bad day. You're going to have an unpleasant moment. You're going to say something you wish you wouldn't have said. You're not going to do something you said you would do. You're going to need grace too. So if I can remember that I have bad days and I have unpleasant moments and I want grace when I have a day like that, it's going to change my disposition and I'm going to be more inclined to be gracious to my teammates. Church. Now if you have apostolic authority like Paul, I guess you can just rebuke anybody you want. But if you, are, if you feel like I do, I don't have apostolic power and uh, Christ is not going to work through me in that way, then we have to have this more gracious and gentle spirit when we're dealing with each other. They had great success on the island. Uh, Sergius Paulus became a Christian. You know what really fascinates me? He was only there a couple of years. And when his term of duty was over, he went back to Rome and became a senator again. The first Christian senator in the Roman Senate became a Christian because Paul and Barnabas were willing to try something new. And they worked well as a team together. And Sergius Paulus became a Christian and he took his faith back to Rome with him and who knows how much influence he had in the Senate as a Christian man. The method need, meant they had to move on. So they got on a boat in um, Paphos and uh, they sailed straight north to uh, uh, Perga Pamphylia. You can look this up in the, in the, on the map on, at the back of your Bible also. It's another uh, a port city and it's probably a trade route city. So they were following trade routes to these important cities. And when they got to uh, Perga Pamphylia, uh, Mark said, uh, you know, uh, this isn't for me. I don't like this. I'm going home. And Luke tells us, he got on a boat, and went home. Um, Alfred Edersheim, in his great book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, believes that John Mark's mom and dad were the ones who owned the upper room where Jesus ate the Last Supper and that they were wealthy people. So John thought he wanted to go with Barnabas and Saul on this, on this trip, but he got partway through it and he goes, mm, no, I, I, I'm going home. You know, these lessons are in the Bible for a reason. Um, uh, when, we are, when we're trying new things and when we're really trying to expand the church, 
Uh, we have to expect that from time to time, Mark will go home. From time to time, Mark will go home. Uh, yeah. In a life group, from time to time, somebody you might like might, will change their mind and say, I, 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 I'm not going to this life group anymore, whatever. In a ministry, somebody that you might enjoy their company, they might say to you, you know what, this isn't for me, I, I, I'm out. All right. I'm going to ask you, what do you do when the people around you that you are counting on don't do what you want them to do? Well, I'll tell you what Paul and Barnabas did. They just went straight on. They said, that's, what, that's Mark's decision, that's not my decision, and they didn't allow Mark to bring them down. They didn't allow Mark to dissuade them. They didn't allow Mark to turn their head. They simply said, if Mark doesn't want to go, that's Mark's deal. We're not, because he doesn't want to go doesn't mean we're not going forward. Can you hear this? The church has to have a spirit that says, if, uh, uh, if the people that I don't want to quit, quit, by the grace of God, I persevere. By the grace of God, I go on serving him. By the grace of God, I continue. I, I can't tell you over the years, uh, uh, people have left, and I thought they were my friends, and they said mean things, and, and uh, it's discouraging. It's disappointing, but listen, listen. The model in the New Testament is because somebody else gives up doesn't mean I have to give up. Because somebody else says no doesn't mean I have to say no. Because somebody else is discouraged doesn't mean I have to buy their discouragement. We have to have the spirit of Paul and Barnabas. We are a team. We're going to figure this out. We're going to work together. We're going to problem solve together. And we're going to see the great things God can do if we persist. Do you see? In, in, uh, in, in, in a church like ours, we're, we, we try new things. We build new teams. We create new life groups. Uh, look, some of them work and some of them don't. Nobody has a 100% track record. I mean, Billy Graham himself wasn't 100%. Uh, 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 we can't be 100%. All right. And in those times where things don't work the way we want them to, the spirit of Jesus Christ in Paul and Barnabas said, I'll bless you anyway. Just keep going forward. Church. There are people sitting here this morning who uh, they've had moments just like I'm talking about, and it wasn't pleasant and it wasn't fun, but they kept going forward, and today they would tell you they're glad they did. Church. Paul and Barnabas walked straight north to Antioch, Pisidian, and they, they, they had created a method now. Now they knew how to go follow the trade routes to uh, meaningful cities. Now they knew uh, how to meet new people in these cities. Uh, now they were getting a feel for it, and it became a repeatable model. Do you see? They changed the church by experimenting with something new, and what worked out of that, that became their model, and Paul started churches all over the Roman Empire by simply following the model that he created when he went to uh, Cyprus. Paul and Barnabas separate for the second mission trip. Barnabas takes John Mark and tries to mentor him all over again. Never give up on people. Paul takes Silas, and they went to a whole different group of cities, and they started different churches. And uh, we, ha we, we have New Testament Christianity and it's born out of Paul trying something new, figuring out what worked, and then repeating that model in, in other cities. Church. The church begins a new era when new leaders start new things. I want to say that again. The church begins a new era when new leaders start new things. Uh, 
you know I've been here 41 years, but I have all kinds of space in my mind and in my heart to let new leaders try new things. No, but none of our new leaders have to repeat what we've been doing for 40 years. They have to repeat the message, but they don't have to repeat the methods. Are, are, are you with me? What created a, the methods that created this church are not the methods, methods that will create our century church. The methods that are going to create our next generation church are methods that are going to come out of the life experience and uh, the cultural need uh, of the next generation. And just like in the New Testament church, just like in the New Testament, the cutting edge of what God was doing in the world wasn't in Jerusalem anymore. It wasn't even in Antioch anymore. It was in Paul and Barnabas and, and uh, Mark and, and, uh, and Silas and Timothy and Titus and Trophimus. And the list goes on and on and on of the young men that Paul discipled. And they went out, they went to these Roman cities, and they found ways to share the message of Jesus Christ in ways that people would listen to. And the church exploded over the Roman Empire. Do you hear me? The, uh, the, the, the church of tomorrow is guided by the same God who got us where we are. Do you hear this? And in the very same way that he built great churches in our lifetime, he wants to build great churches in the coming generation's lifetime. But the way we're going to do it is we're going to try new things together in teams. I want you to join a life group. I want you to be part of the, of the, uh, um, the all church emphasis. Uh, if you don't like it, I'll give you money for breakfast. Uh, 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 I want us to I want us to have a fighting chance at having strong enough relationships that we can try new things and new ministries and see what God will do. Our dear heavenly Father, you do all things well. I'm a, I, I appreciate the example of uh, Paul and Barnabas in the, uh, in the book of Acts. I, I, I appreciate this, this, uh, this uh, living example of what you do when you start creating a new era in Christianity. And I pray that this spirit would be in our church. I pray that we would have the heart for it. I pray that we'd be willing to uh, 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 unite in teams and we, we would try hard things together. I pray when it gets difficult, we would be gracious to each other. I pray that the discouragement of others would not discourage us. And I pray that Christ would be glorified by this church starting um, uh, uh, tens of other churches in our lifetime. In Jesus' name.